Is this the American dream? In the United States, 44% of Americans are low-wage earners, often working multiple jobs. In fact, wages haven't increased significantly since the 70s, while productivity has continued to rise. And the federal minimum wage hasn't changed since 2009. Meanwhile, some 4,000 miles away from Washington, D.C., Sweden boasts of high wages for most workers, high levels of productivity for businesses, and general high levels of equality in society. Many of the Nordic countries don't even have a minimum wage, officially. Wait, what? Sweden, they have very, very high levels of union density. Union membership in the United States peaked in 1954 at 28.3% of the total workforce, but that number stands at only 10.8% today. That sharp decline in the power of U.S. trade unions has made it harder for American workers to negotiate for better pay. The U.S. labor movement built its strength through decades of bitter, often bloody struggles that helped give Americans protections in the workplace. Protections such as the 40-hour work week, the minimum wage, and an end to child labor. Unions were also a significant part of broader struggles for economic and racial justice. Hey guys, it's Dina, and today we're going to see if the U.S. can learn anything from the labor unions in France, Argentina, and Sweden. We can't really talk about powerful labor unions without talking about... France. France legalized unions in 1884. Throughout the tumultuous 20th century, French unions remained the main institution protecting social welfare. Today, French unions represent only a small fraction of French workers, just 10.8%. That actually matches the small percentage of US workers in unions. So how are these French union workers, who tend to belong to the public sector, punching above their weight? Well, the vast majority of French workers benefit from the collective bargaining agreements negotiated by unions, even if they're not official members of a particular union. French unions also organize against cuts to public services and social welfare programs. This might be why public support for strikes remains strong. At the end of 2019, France experienced its longest strike in half a century. The strike was in protest to propose changes to the country's vaunted pension system that would have ended early retirement privileges for some workers. The proposed changes were the latest in a series of so-called reforms pushed by French President Emmanuel Macron. I want France to be a startup nation, meaning both a nation that works with and for the startups, but also a nation that thinks and moves like a startup. Even after several weeks of disrupted holiday travel for hundreds of thousands of people in France, 61% of those polled said that the strikes were justified. La population est globalement favorable au mouvement, défavorable à cette réforme, qui touche tout le monde, pas que nous, hein. nous beaucoup, mais pas, pas que nous. The strikes managed to block the pension changes before COVID-19 led Macron to postpone them entirely. So if French workers are able to resist reforms by going on strike, why don't Americans? Well, in France, the right to strike has been enshrined in the Constitution since 1946. In the United States, the right to strike was established by the National Labor Relations Act in 1935. But that law also imposed limitations on when strikes are legal. In the US, public sector workers' right to strike is not protected at the federal level. By contrast, in France, public sector workers can strike and they often exert this power to resist budget cuts to public spending that would impact all French citizens. But it's not only France where unions are at the forefront of social movements. The power of unions in Argentina took off during the 1940s with the ascendancy of Colonel Juan Domingo Perón. First as Secretary of Labor under a military dictatorship and then as president, Perón implemented labor-friendly policies to build support among unions. These workers formed his political base. Eh, en nuestro tiempo, gobernar es crear trabajo. The reforms included regulating working conditions, introducing paid vacations, and unionizing previously unorganized workers. This support strengthened unions in negotiations, but it had a major catch. For unions to receive support, they had to replace any communist leaders they might have had. Between 1945 and 1954, the number of unionized workers in Argentina more than quadrupled. 
Then, in 1976, a US-backed military junta seized power, and it was particularly hostile to unions. They passed a security law that explicitly banned strikes. Argentina's unions organized several general strikes anyway, helping to weaken the power of the dictatorship, which ultimately ended in 1983. The political culture has endured into the 21st century, and Argentine workers continue to take their union rights very seriously. Back in 2005, four McDonald's delivery workers were fired by their employer, a third-party delivery company, for wanting to join a union. In response, their co-workers occupied a McDonald's location in the heart of Buenos Aires. El reclamo es la reincorporación de, de nuestros compañeros despedidos por una, por una persecución gremial porque nos empezamos a organizar y bueno, tomaron la decisión de, de echarlos para desorganizarnos, desarticularnos. Eventually, their employer was ordered to reinstate the fired workers and recognize their union. Unions have also helped Argentine workers push back against big corporations during the COVID-19 pandemic. In spring 2020, McDonald's announced they would be cutting workers' salaries in Argentina by 50% since they would be working fewer hours. The fast food workers' union pushed back and negotiated full pay for all hours worked, as well as partial pay for workers' lost hours. Unions have also extended solidarity to other social movements in Argentina. For example, unions and feminist organizations came together to organize the first national women's strike in October 2016. These campaigns at the intersection of unions and the feminist movement eventually led to Argentina legalizing abortion at the end of 2020. But neither French nor Argentine union numbers come close to this Scandinavian countries. Sweden, which has one of the highest rates of unionized employees in the world at 67%, Approximately 90% of the employees in Sweden are covered by collective bargaining agreements, even if they're not in a union themselves. We spoke to David Madland, whose new book outlines the reforms needed to revitalize unions in the U.S. and which countries can serve as models. In Sweden, they have very, very high levels of union density and very high levels of collective bargaining coverage. That has led to high wages for most workers, very high levels of equality in society, and high levels of productivity for their employers. Under the Swedish model, labor and business maintain a working relationship. As long as collective bargaining agreements remain in place, unions commit themselves to refrain from going on strike. This might be why we're not seeing the same strike footage in Sweden that we saw in France and Argentina. We also spoke to Martin Linder, the president of Unionen, which is Sweden's union for white-collar workers. In my experience, uh, with that kind of unions, the employers rather bargain with uh, us uh, as that kind of union, and in that way set up conditions in collective agreements, instead of politicians uh, doing that uh, by law and collective political regulation. In fact, Sweden doesn't even have a minimum wage. But despite that, real wages in Sweden increased almost 60% between 1995 and 2016, compared to just 11.5% in the U.S. over the same period. Over the last few decades, Sweden's labor system has created a stable environment for both workers and businesses, featuring lower rates of unemployment and inflation, as well as fewer strikes. Well, if you go uh, way back in the past, it was a very conflict-oriented labor market in Sweden. But for the last 30 or 40 years, I would like to say, we have seen a development that has been not so much conflict-oriented, more pragmatic. And from the union side, I would like to say that we, in general, have a pragmatic, result-driven relationship with business. So if Swedish unions negotiate higher wages for all workers, regardless of whether or not they're actually in a union, why hasn't this led to a lower level of union membership? Well, many workers join Swedish unions because they provide benefits, like unemployment insurance for workers, via something called the Ghent system. The Ghent system in Sweden, unions help provide unemployment insurance. And so most people get their unemployment insurance through the union. It is a very, it's a good, effective system and the benefits are really quite good. You're not going to be forced to live into poverty if you suddenly become unemployed. It's also very closely connected with the reemployment system and the training system. And the stability offered by this system has become incredibly vital in the wake of COVID-19. You can see that uh, in this pandemic and this uncertainty, uh, the trade unions in Sweden has uh, offered something that people has uh, wanted to be a part of. 
France, Argentina, and Sweden have very different labor systems, but they all have one thing in common that's missing in the United States, sectoral bargaining. Sectoral bargaining is this uh, way of negotiating collective bargaining agreements that cover all workers in an industry or a region, whether or not they're unionized or not. While the majority of American unions negotiate for workers at the workplace level, some unions have gotten close to sectoral bargaining in the past. In the industries where the unions had very, very high density, like auto or steel in the 1950s and 60s, they developed something like sectoral bargaining where most all workers in the industry were covered by very similar agreements and in some ways this was very much the system that helped build the U.S. middle class into the envy of the rest of the world. And politicians are beginning to recognize this problem. Most Democratic presidential candidates during the 2020 election had proposals for sectoral bargaining. People from, you know, Bernie Sanders on the left to Mayor Bloomberg on the sort of right that this was pretty universal. President Biden had a plan to create a commission to study sectoral bargaining as well. In the meantime, a major slate of labor reforms is working its way through Congress. The Protecting the Right to Organize Act, or PRO Act, doesn't include sectoral bargaining, but the reforms it does include would make it easier for workers to form unions. The PRO Act bans certain employer activities meant to hinder workers organizing. We have such a broken labor law that doesn't allow even the very basics and the PRO Act takes major, major steps towards getting the basics right about U.S. labor law. We can and should do more than the PRO Act, but the PRO Act is the fundamental first step. 